ElfQuest or ElfQuest is a cult hit comic book property created by Wendy and Richard Pinney in 1978. It is a fantasy story about a community of elves and other fictional species who struggle to survive and coexist on a primitive Earth-like planet with two moons. Several published volumes of prose fiction also share the same setting. ElfQuest was one of the first comic book series to have a planned conclusion. Over the years ElfQuest has been self-published by the Pinnies through their own company Warp Graphics, then Marvel Comics, then the Pinnies again, more recently DC Comics and then Dark Horse Comics. All issues of ElfQuest published prior to 2013 are available online for free. Topic: <laughs> Publication history. The first ElfQuest story was published in February 1978, in the underground comic book Fantasy Quarterly, published by Lansing, Michigan-based IPS Independent Publishers Syndicate. That company closed after publishing the first issue of ElfQuest. Sandwiched between ElfQuest's Fire and Flight, Parts 1 and 2 was a brief story written by T. Casey Brennan and illustrated by Cerebus the Aardvark creator Dave Sim titled, Doorway to the Gods. The quality of the publication was disappointing to Wendy and Richard Pinney. The interior was printed on newsprint, and the cover was printed, in a very limited color palette, on only slightly heavier, uncoated paper stock. <laughs> Warp graphics The poor quality of this publication convinced the Pinnies that they could produce a higher quality publication on their own. After borrowing money in order to start Warp Graphics, the Pinnies started publishing with ElfQuest No. 2 published magazine size with glossy full-color covers and a character portrait print on the back cover by Wendy, a format that would continue throughout the series' entire run. This story continued the ElfQuest tale started in Fantasy Quarterly. Later, the Pinnaces company Warp Graphics would reprint the story from Fantasy Quarterly as ElfQuest No. 1 with a new front cover and full-color portrait print for the rear cover. This series was one of the early successes that marked the establishment of a phase in underground comics in which a new genre of alternative independent comic books emerged that were closer in content to the comics mainstream. ElfQuest was also one of the first comic book series that had a prearranged conclusion. It was highly praised for its innovative themes. The fact that a female artist, writer, Wendy Pinney, was the creative principal of the series was also notable. The original series—generally referred to as The Original Quest, or OQ—ran for 20 magazine size issues spanning about seven to eight years in terms of the main storyline, released triannually, color compilations published by the Donning Company under its Starblaze imprint as books one to four followed. Two more series were published in a reduced comic book size format, but still in black and white, Siege at Blue Mountain eight issues and Kings of the Broken Wheel nine issues, later collected and published in color as part of a second edition of the graphic novels as books five to eight. The stories take place three years after the original quest. Topic. Warp graphics explosion and implosion In the 1990s, the Pinnies rebranded slightly Warp became Warp and then began to publish multiple titles concurrently, many with overlapping storylines, introducing many new artists and writers to the series. The initially color titles New Blood, Hidden Years, and Shards for the most part carried the main storyline forward from the prehistoric to the medieval period of the world of two moons, now named Abode, occasionally featuring non-canonical stories. The historical background of the Wolfriders was filled out in Blood of Ten Chiefs, Two Spear, and Kavi. The future of Abode was explored in The Rebels and Jink, set at a time when humans have reached space and colonized other worlds and the elves have all but disappeared. A fifth tribe of elves, the Wave Dancers, was introduced only to be redacted from continuity. A one-shot issue reintroduced the Sea Elves with a new cast of characters. The first ten issues of Hidden Years were collected in two color volumes, Hidden Years and Rogue's Challenge Book 9 in the continuity of the second edition of graphic novels. 
Selected stories from the first ten issues of New Blood were collected as New Blood and Bedtime Stories. Towards the end of their runs, in the mid-1990s, most of these titles reverted to black and white in North America, though some were published in color in Europe. In large part as a response to the shrinking direct market in the mid-1990s, continuing storylines were collapsed together into a single 64-page anthology series introduced by the one-shot Metamorphosis. The new series was simply titled ElfQuest Volume 2 and ran for 33 issues. Topic: <laughs> Other media. The series has also served as the basis for three novelizations: Journey to Sorrow's End, The Quest Begins, and Captives of Blue Mountain, and five Blood of Ten Chiefs. Short story anthologies, some of which served as the basis of scripts in Blood of Ten Chiefs comic book series. The music CDA Wolfrider's Reflections is an album of folk songs based on elements from the original quest. Several collectibles, calendars, apparel, a role playing game, and figurines have been sold over the years. The full length novel Elf Quest Journey to Sorrow's End, which included both text and several black and white illustrated plates, was published by Playboy in 1982 and Berkeley in March 1984. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Marvel. In 1985, the original series was reprinted in 32 installments with additional bridging pages necessitated by the Marvel Comics, at 22 pages each, breaking at different points in the story than the Warp Comics, which were 32 pages and published by Marvel Comics's Epic Imprint. This gave the series some much-needed mass-market exposure. Marvel's license was only for the original series, which was already completed, so none of the sequels followed suit. Most of the additional material bridging pages and panels was incorporated into subsequent print collections and the online edition. <laughs> DC Comics In March 2003 it was announced that after 25 years of self-publication the Pinnies had licensed all publishing and merchandising rights in the series to DC Comics, although the Pinnies retained creative control. DC's publication of ElfQuest material began in July 2003 with the ElfQuest 25th Anniversary Special, reprinting the first issue of ElfQuest with new computer coloring and lettering by Wendy Pinney, and two short interviews with the Pinnies. This was a teaser for the ElfQuest Archives, hardcover color compilation volumes which began in November 2003. This series was planned reprint the first eight graphic novel collections in glossy format with new coloring and lettering. Fans have complained that the publication schedule is disappointingly slow. Volume 2 was originally scheduled to appear in fall 2004 but after some delays was finally released in March 2005, 16 months after Volume 1. Part of the reason for the delay is that Wendy Pinney was undergoing hip replacement surgery. Meanwhile, September 2003 saw the publication of ElfQuest, Wolfrider Vol. 1, beginning a series of bi-monthly manga-sized black and white reprint collections which arrange the story into chronological order for the first time, beginning around 600 years before the events in the original series. Wolfrider Vol. 2 is followed chronologically by ElfQuest, The Grand Quest Vol. 1, the first in a series reprinting the original storyline, including the additional art drawn for the Marvel version. In this series, the original artwork has been rearranged into new panel layouts for clarity in the physically smaller manga format, which sometimes involved Wendy Pinney adding extensions to the original artwork. Unfortunately, some sections of the original artwork are not included, for example in ElfQuest, The Grand Quest Vol. 11. A standalone story involving Tyleet and her adopted human son Little Patch is not in the volume though later in Vol. 13 Tyleet mentions Little Patch constantly while discussing the dream she had while encased for 10,000 years by the preservers. A newer book, ElfQuest, The Searcher and the Sword was published in July 2004. Critical reaction was generally favorable. The major criticism leveled at the book is that it is overpriced for its size, 96 pages. 
After the four-issue comic series ElfQuest, Discovery, published in 2006, no more new stories appeared until the final quest 2013 see below. Online release In March 2008 Warp Graphics began uploading previously published stories to the ElfQuest.com website, for reading on the web. They intended to make the entire series available online over the course of 2008, but the issues proved too numerous to upload within the deadline. Uploading of all comics was completed on March 13, 2009. In September 2012, the latest series Final Quest Prologue story began publication at a rate of one page per week at Boing Boing. Only about half of the prologue appeared there, deliberately, as a teaser leading to the print and digital publication planned for 2013 by Dark Horse Comics. <laughs> Final Quest In October 2013, an ElfQuest special, The Final Quest One-Shot was published by Dark Horse Comics. It includes the material originally seen at Boing Boing plus the rest of the Final Quest prologue. The Final Quest series began publication by Dark Horse Comics. The first issue was released on January 22, 2014. The entire Final Quest series ran for 24 issues. The final issue, issue 24, was released on February 28, 2018, exactly 40 years after issue 1 of the original Quest was first released. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Background and setting. The world where the series takes place, eventually called Abode by its human inhabitants, but originally referred to as the World of Two Moons, superficially resembles Earth. The geography is marginally similar, there are some unusual prehistoric survivals among the fauna, and in early storylines Abode could have been described as Earth with two moons. As the story moves forward however, and Abode's history develops, it becomes apparent that its human culture and technology is distinguished by the 20,000 years of influence by the elves, who have left an indelible mark on human society, though their existence is unacknowledged and unofficially suppressed by the world government of Abode's future. The elves of ElfQuest are descended from highly advanced humanoid aliens called High Ones by their descendants. When their homeworld's natural resources became depleted due to overpopulation, they went spacefaring in order to find new planets to settle. Some of them returned to their dead homeworld, and ended up awakening their immense psychokinetic psychic powers and ability to not die of old age. They eventually resumed spacefaring to explore the wider universe, creating and using egg-shaped vessels they controlled using telekinesis and were able to adapt to any ecosystem by shifting their own shapes and metabolisms. As companions, they brought two of the last surviving animal species from their home, both of which gradually evolved during the journey and subsequent events into two more races of sapient near-immortals, the insectoid preservers and the simian-descended trolls. After journeying to many different worlds, one of these vessels came to abode known to its inhabitants as the World of Two Moons, where human civilization had reached a level comparable to Europe's medieval period on Earth. The humans' artwork and literature depicted angels, deities, spirits and other ethereal beings which suggested to the High Ones that others of their kind had previously visited that world. In order to facilitate contact with the humans, before landing on the world, the High Ones deliberately formed themselves like elves and reshaped their egg vessel to resemble a beautiful floating castle that matched the native architectural idiom, so that they could stay long enough to seek out more information about the previous visitors. The palace itself consists of two main parts, the magical material of which it is made, and two magic scrolls that contain all the history of the High Ones. The palace is also where the souls of dead elves come together to spend the rest of their existence. However, by this time the evolved simians proto -trolls had become resentful of their subservient status and wished to permanently remain on the world. As the castle began to descend, the simians violently rebelled, disrupting the telekinetic controls enough to hurl the entire vessel and its contents back through time to Abode's Paleolithic era. 
Staggering out from the crash landing, the High Ones found that their psychic powers were greatly weakened on abode, leaving them unable to defend themselves from the prehistoric cave-dwelling humans who fearfully attacked them. Forcibly dispersed away from the massacre outside the palace-shaped vessel, many of the initial elf survivors soon died, unable to adapt to the hostile environment, the others gradually gathered into several widely scattered tribes. The known tribes include in order of introduction the wolf riders forest dwelling hunter gatherers sun folk desert dwelling farmers gliders mountain dwellers only a few of whom hunt go backs formerly hunters now primarily reindeer herders and the wave dancers sea dwelling hunter gatherers the high ones evolved simian servants also fled mainly into networks of underground caverns where they became larger and established themselves as the subterranean race of trolls, treasure-seeking miners and metal smiths whose original links to the high ones were forgotten. The main story begins 10,000 years later with elves and other beings having adapted with great difficulty to their home. Each tribe of elves has its own set of adaptations and traditions, and most of them are unaware that any of the other tribes even exist. Cast The Wolf Riders The central characters are the Wolfrider Elves, a tribe of ferocious hunter, warriors closely allied with wolves who serve as mounts, hunting partners, and friends. Their culture is roughly comparable to the Iroquois Native American nation. Within their founder group, a female High One named Timane had been the only member to retain her shape-shifting ability. When winter came, Timane shape-shifted into a wolf to hunt food for the starving elves around her. She sank very deeply into her wolf form and eventually forgot her original identity, even mating with a native wolf to produce a half-wolf chimeric son whom she handed over to the elves after teaching him as much as she could as a wolf. They gave him the name Timorn Yellow Eyes and he became the first chief of the wolf riders, bringing the wolf pack and the stranded elves together to form a close symbiotic alliance. Because of his mixed blood, Timorn was mortal, unlike his progenitors. Timorn then went on to sire many children, with both wolves and elves. As a result, the entire tribe and their bonded wolf pack can all trace their bloodline back to Timorn in some way by the point at which the series begins. This mingling of wolf and elf blood produces unexpected results aside from maintaining a feral, wolf like mentality known as the way. The wolf riders are the only elves who can, eventually, die of old age. In addition to the close bonds with their wolves, the wolf riders also have some basic psychic powers like telepathy known as sending, healing and plant manipulation. Because of the hybridization, their wolves also possess powers of telepathy, allowing wolf riders to send with their wolves. The central storyline, beginning with the series known as the Grand Quest or Original Quest, focuses on the tribe during the leadership of their 11th chief cutter. At the start of the story, the Wolfrider's regular forest life, intermittently interspersed by conflict with superstitiously genocidal humans, is lost when the humans set fire to the forest in retaliation for a previous battle. The Wolfriders seek refuge in the underground caverns of their sullen, greedy, cowardly trade partners, the Trolls. The Elves claim that the Trolls owe them sanctuary because of all the ways the Wolfriders have helped them over the years, but the corrupt Troll King, Greymung, feels humiliated for being held at knife point by an Elf and plots revenge. The Elves are taken down a long tunnel toward what the Trolls claim will be a land of bright promise, but is actually a trackless desert. Then their guide seals the tunnel behind them. Desperately inspired by a piece of magic. Lodestone they obtained from the trolls' caves that acts as a crude compass, they make an arduous journey across the wasteland until they encounter an oasis called Sorrow's End, populated by a tribe of sedentary, agrarian elves called the Sun Folk. <laughs> the Sun Folk Compared to the Wolf Riders, the peaceful Sun Folk have retained more knowledge about the High Ones. However, there are some psychic phenomena which have remained more common among the wolf riders than among the sun folk, such as sending, telepathic communication, and recognition, a powerful involuntary compulsion to mate with another elf. This mating is guaranteed to produce offspring who are more powerful than either parent. 
This powerful impulse can be resisted with difficulty, but at the cost of great personal stress. If the two individuals are not temperamentally compatible, they may part ways again as soon as a child has been produced, but otherwise they may form a lifelong pair bond as life mates. Cutter's partner in recognition is the Sun Folk's beautiful and powerful healer, Lita. She immediately rejects him as a savage barbarian, especially since she is already partnered to her villagers' haughty chief hunter, Rayak. The love triangle between Cutter, Lita and Rayek is the main focus of much of the first part of the story. Cutter and Lita eventually become life mates, bested by Cutter in a ritual trial and displaced as soul hunter and protector by the Wolfriders, Rayek leaves the village. Once this conflict is resolved, the two tribes quickly unite with each side willing to adjust to the other for their mutual benefit. The Wolfriders enjoy the benefits of a more sophisticated culture with greater knowledge, while the Sunfolk benefit from a band of strong hunters and defenders of their desert refuge from humanity. Six years later, the Oasis Sanctuary of Sorrow's End is breached by a handful of starving humans who approach the Oasis. Although they are sent on their way probably to die of thirst, Cutter realizes that more could follow and decides to take action. He goes on a quest with his sole brother, Skywise, seeking other elf tribes as allies against humanity. Later, Cutter's son, Suntop, receives a warning from the Sun Folk's elder Sava, the mother of memory about an evil which Cutter must avoid. Sava, who is close to being a high one herself, possesses a magical ability known as going out, where her spirit leaves her body and attempts to connect to other elves. In this way she was also able to briefly contact Rayek after he left Sorrow's End. The majority of the Wolfriders escort Lita, Suntop and his twin sister Ember on their journey to deliver Sava's warning to Cutter and Skywise. <laughs> the Gliders Continuing their quest, Cutter and Skywise learn of the existence of another elf tribe dwelling in a place called Blue Mountain. This previously unknown tribe, consisting of tall, thin, graceful elves, is known as the Gliders. They treated humans like any other prey, until a human shaman made her way near the peak of Blue Mountain and sang and talked to them. The Gliders then agreed not to hunt humans, if they in turn received offerings and worship. The humans then worshipped them as Spirit gods. The gliders claim to be original high ones and are nominally led by an ancient elf named Lord Vol. He wanted them to have a safe home, thus, their rock shapers built a home inside Blue Mountain after the memories of the Palace of the High Ones. After Lord Vol's lover and confidant Winoil created the Chosen Eight, a group of hunters that rode the giant hawks that nested in Blue Mountain, no one but those hunters left the mountain. They are a conservative community that has degenerated into insular decadence, dominated by the seductive, sinister Winoil, who was once Vol's consort but who now has her own agenda. Cut off from new impulses, the Gliders' culture turned in on itself. They created intricate art, such as the Egg of Six Spheres, which recorded the elves' history, but stopped growing. For millennia no children were born. Some of the rock shapers were put into permanent trance, and do nothing but fulfill a certain function. Winoil manipulated Vol, so that his plans to leave Blue Mountain again never grew to fruition. Lord Vol came to believe that the elves were doomed to wither, and that there would never be any children born. Only the arrival of the Wolfriders with their children and the Preservers could wake him up. He was then determined to return to the Palace of the High Ones as soon as possible, but was killed before reaching it, leaving Winoil as new Lord of the Gliders. The Gliders rarely venture out of their mountain except for the Chosen Eight, the tribe's hunters and, if need be, warriors. Although they have their own powers of cyclic levitation, the eight ride massive birds with whom they share a strong bond, similar to that of the Wolfriders and their wolves. As the Wolfriders search for Cutter and Skywise, Strongbow shoots down one of the massive birds for food. Enraged at the death of their mount, the Gliders attack the Wolfriders and imprison most of the tribe within Blue Mountain. Winoil then tortures Strongbow for the death of the bird, while Lita, Ember, and Suntop hide in the Forbidden Grove, which is the home of the Preservers. Nightfall and Redlance also manage to escape imprisonment, and stumble upon Cutter and Skywise shortly after Cutter and his family are reunited. 
One eye, also not captured, lurks around the base of the mountain surviving on the human's unknown generosity. Jushine, much to the dismay of her and her tribe, becomes recognized by one of the gliders named Tildik. Tildik has been reshaped by Winoil to resemble a bird himself. Both fight the recognition at first, but eventually give in and Jushine becomes pregnant. Winoil put all gliders but the chosen eight into deep sleep, and attempted to use their magic powers to shape Blue Mountain into a vessel to leave the world of two moons. This plan was foiled by the Wolfriders. The already reshaped Blue Mountain shattered, and nearly all gliders were killed. As a people or tribe, the gliders do not exist anymore. What follows is a difficult but enlightening journey, in which the elves' most basic assumptions about the world are turned upside down as they meet humans who are more good than they ever hoped, elves more evil than they ever imagined, and trolls more aggressive than they ever feared. Throughout these adventures, Cutter and his companions learn about the world and themselves in profound ways. The Go Backs The Go Backs are the fourth and last elf tribe encountered during the original quest. Originally a migrating tribe, the Go Backs are named after a sudden desire to go back to the Palace of the High Ones. The palace has a strong pull on all elves once in range, the Go Backs were the first to stumble on it since the High Ones were driven away. First appearing to save Cutter and his followers from a war party of trolls in a snow-bound tundra, the Gobaks are arctic-dwelling elk herders, bearing about the same resemblance to Sami as the wolfriders do to Iroquois and the sun folk to Mesoamericans that is to say, mainly in costume. They are highly warlike and hardened, being locked in continual strife with the trolls who bar their way to the palace. They have a prejudice against magic, but not to the extent of persecuting its users. The go backs, so removed from magic, no longer rely on recognition to procreate. They provided the bulk of the military strength that allowed the completion of the first quest, and lost half their numbers in doing so. The High Ones The High Ones were an advanced race, resembling the aliens known as Greys. They were stranded on a boat after their ship, the palace, was sabotaged from within and crash landed. There are few, if any, known High Ones remaining on a boat, though they live on in their descendants, the elves, trolls, and preservers. Topic: <laughs> Adaptations. Besides an unofficial homage in Marvel's X-Men No. 153 Kitty Pride wears an Elf Quest t-shirt throughout the issue, and a sprite named Pinny appears on P. 16, Elf Quest has been adapted into a range of media. A scene from Elf Quest between Cutter and Lita in Sun Village was also performed as part of a theater rehearsal in Fantastic Four No. 242. While not an adaptation in the strictest sense of the term, Piers Anthony's 13th Xanth novel Isle of View introduces a character named Jenny Elf, a wolfrider who was magically brought to Xanth from abode after a tragic accident. Jenny Elf, by the author's own admission, is a tribute to a young girl who was paralyzed by a drunk driver. Jenny Elf continues to be a character in subsequent Xanth novels. Warp Graphics published the first volume of a graphic novel adaptation of Isle of View entitled Return to Centaur. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Film. In 1982, the Pinnies announced in ElfQuest that talks had been initiated by Nelvana to produce an animated film based on the story, which was contemplated to open after issue hash #20's anticipated release in late 1984. While described as being in the very early planning stages, nothing further was ever mentioned about this project. In 2008, Warner Brothers announced its intention to bring the ElfQuest saga to the big screen, with Rawson Thurber serving as writer and director. The format live action, CGI, or traditional animation is yet unknown. However, it was confirmed on ElfQuest's official Facebook page that Warner Brothers ultimately said, No. The ostensible reason is that Warner Brothers didn't want the film competing with their film The Hobbit. 
In 2013 there are rumors of recapping the project on behalf of the producers of a fan-made trailer which appeared a few years ago. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Animated video series In the early 1990s, an ad for a multi-volume animated adaptation of ElfQuest appeared in the comic. A few issues later, the Pinnies told readers they'd withdrawn from the deal, and that readers should ask for refunds. Those who didn't, eventually received a 50-minute VHS tape from Abbey Lou Entertainment, copyright 1992. Covering the first volume of the book, it consists of color still images taken straight from the comic, some minor animation, and spoken dialogue. Topic. Web trailer Stephanie Thorpe and Paula Rhodes produced a short web trailer entitled ElfQuest, a fan imagining. The Pinnies donated original art for the fundraising campaign, and lent an original dress to the production. The short premiered at the Screen Actors Guild in April 2011 and the cast featured Taryn Southern, Casey McKinnon, Jessica Lee Rose, and more. Topic. Role playing games A licensed tabletop ElfQuest role playing game was produced by Chaosium in 1984, utilizing the basic role playing system which had first appeared in the game Runner Quest and some original illustrations by Wendy Pinney, including the character sheets. Both the role playing game and the comics themselves have sprung a number of online games, mostly mushers. Topic. Toys A brief action figure line was produced, featuring Cutter, Lita with a small petalwing figurine, Picknose, and Tildic. A proposed second series that would have included Skywise among others never reached production. Topic. Board games Two board games featuring the ElfQuest world have been published. In 1986, Mayfair Games released ElfQuest, a competitive game where players lay tiles to build the board as the game proceeds. Players play one of four elf tribes as they try to find the elf homeland or the troll tribe that tries to prevent the elf players from finding the homeland long enough until they can build a dome over it. In 2015, Cheeky Dingo Games released the ElfQuest Adventure Game, a cooperative board game, where the players take four elven characters on a campaign of adventures based on stories from the comic books. The game was funded via Kickstarter. Topic. Music In 1987, Off Centaur Publications released a Wolfrider's Reflections, Songs of ElfQuest, a collection of filk songs. In 2013, several unreleased ElfQuest songs by Julia Eckler were also included on her solo album, Horse Damer. Topic. Awards and honors 1979 Ed April Award New York Comic Art Convention Best Independent Comic 1979 1980 Alley Award 1980 Small Press Writers and Artists Organization Best Artist Comics Wendy Pinney Best Editor Comics Richard and Wendy Pinney 1981 Fantasy Press Comic Art Awards Woody Awards in honor of Wally Wood Best Alternative Comic 1983 Small Press Writers and Artists Organization, Best Comic 1983 Heroes Award, Heroes Aren't Hard to Find Best Black and White Magazine 1984 New York State JCS Distinguished Service Award, Wendy and Richard Pinney 1985 Balrog Award, Sword and Shield Corp. Of Denver, Colorado, Best Artist, Wendy Pinney 1986 Fantasy Festival Comic Book Awards El Paso Fantasy Festival Best Alternative Comic 1987 1988 Skywise ElfQuest character inducted into Massachusetts Institute of Technology freshman class 1989 Golden Pen Award Young Adult Advisory Committee Spokane Washington <laughs>